Hey everybody, Jimmy here. So this is a review and an analysis of the Joe Rogan podcast number 961 that played a day and a half ago with Graham Hancock, Randall Carlson, Michael Shermer, and Mark DeFont. So I got a few things to say about this. And, and real quick, if you haven't seen the original podcast with Joe Rogan where he's had Randall Carlson on a few times, Graham Hancock on, and the two of them together, you need to go back and watch those first because all of those are a buildup to what happened a day and a half ago, which was pretty epic. So real quick, where it stands right now, a day and a half after it aired uh, on YouTube, it has just over 660,000 views, more than 15,000 thumbs up, 900 thumbs down. And apparently that's just a fraction of the people that have viewed it because it's a podcast and YouTube is just a small portion of it. So let me just dive into this. Let me start off with Michael Shermer, paid skeptic, runs Skeptic Magazine. And, you know, <laughs> how do I put this? Someone made a comment on Joe Rogan's YouTube podcast saying that how ironic that you have Michael Shermer as a skeptic when in all actuality, he's just an establishment guy and Graham Hancock is the real skeptic because he's the one trying to, well, he's a skeptic of the establishment narrative that we've been taught in school. So I thought that was pretty funny. But when you have Michael Shermer, who's paid to do what he does, and he wasn't even able to speak to the theory of the water erosion around the Sphinx that just debunks the true age. And when I say theory, it's not really a theory. If you look into this yourself, it, the evidence is just overwhelmingly conclusive. And one thing I wish that was mentioned in the podcast, because he cited uh, Robert Schock and, and other geologists who have visited the site, but there's been hundreds of uh, geologists from around the world have, that have visited the site of the Great Sphinx and have said conclusively that the water erosion around the limestone bedrock is just, well, it's overwhelmingly conclusive and it just completely debunks the narrative that we've been taught about the true age of the Sphinx. And the fact that Michael Shermer wasn't even aware of this or able to speak to it, I mean, that's interesting. And to me, it's very, very indicative of the fact that he, Michael Shermer, is not actually passionate about these subjects at all. He's just in it for the money. I mean, let me give you another example. He's never even been to the pyramids. In fact, it sounds like he never even been to Egypt altogether, at least not Giza. I mean, think about that. This is a guy that is trying to debunk anyone that questions the establishment viewpoint, but he was trying to defend that the oldest pyramids, if you're not aware, the oldest pyramids are the biggest and the most structurally sound and have clearly the best quality and craftsmanship and technological know-how. And the newest ones, the smallest ones, the step ones, are falling apart. They're, they're just, it's a complete de-evolution of technological abilities, which makes no sense, right? Don't things get better over time? And anyways, the point that Graham Hancock was making with that is that, well, it just shows that there was some sort of advanced knowledge and over time it went away with the cataclysm. And point is this, that Michael Shermer, for him to be so defensive of anything that is raised or questions the establishment, just goes to show what a shill he actually is. And, and by the way, I'm going to say some really nice things about him here in a second. But for Michael Shermer to question even the human migration narrative, when, I mean, if you saw the podcast, when that slide came up with the Smithsonian talking about, oh, there's evidence of humans being in North America 24,000 years ago. And here he was trying to debunk that when two sentences ahead of it was just, I mean, it was very telling. And for him to even, I mean, guys, if you're not familiar, there's Aboriginal DNA from Australia in mummies in South America, but not in North America. So you have Shermer trying to defend this land bridge from Russia down through North America, and it's like, man, the, ugh. I mean, really, where I'm going with this is where is this guy's due diligence? This is his profession, and I know he covers a lot of different topics on his Skeptic Magazine, but really, come on. And for him, and this is a good point, I'm looking at my notes here, for... Michael Shermer to say to Graham Hancock, hey, wait a second, you have these theories, but all of these Egyptologists have your evidence and don't go along with it at all. Why is that? Isn't that indicative that, well, you're wrong? You know, Michael Shermer, for someone that does what you do, <laughs> isn't it abundantly clear? I mean, I find it really interesting that you can't realize or know the reasons why the mainstream scientists and archaeologists and Egyptologists would try to refute Graham Hancock. Do these people not have a significant financial incentive to do so? I mean, we're talking about people that have had that have written books on the subjects, people that have had textbook deals or even written textbooks themselves, people that have been on live TV, people that have been tenured at various universities because of what they have suggested as far as the narrative of ancient human civilization. 
And when you have Graham Hancock coming to debunk them with actual data and scientific evidence, make no mistake, these people, th their livelihoods are on the line. So of course they're going to ignore and omit the new evidence. And, for the, and, and by the way, some of these people do not underestimate human ego and how denial works. It's a hell of a freaking thing, right? And let me just move on to one last point real quick about Shermer, which is him trying to debunk the possibility of an Atlantis. How many ancient civilizations across multiple continents and around the world need to speak of a land that existed that was superior, uh, as far as the civilization goes, that was wiped off the freaking map, you know, when a flood happened? The same period of time that Plato talks about, the same period of time that Meltwater Pulse 1B happened, where you have 6 million cubic miles of ice sheets across North America that melted in a very short window of time. That, you know, come on, man. Like, really, you need to see wood boats and other things to back up the human migration or, or support Atlantis or other things. Like, the one thing I wish that was mentioned, yet, you know, in this podcast was that, look, you're asking to see more evidence when, you know, what's we're talking 12,000 years, which is such a longer, a much longer period of time than most people appreciate. Because we hear figures like, you know, the dinosaurs going away 65 million years ago or whatever. So when we hear 12,000 years, we don't, it sounds insignificant. But I like to use the, the example of the Titanic, which I've mentioned in several videos of mine, which is this. You have nearly 50,000 tons of steel and iron that has been under the ocean for 105 years, and it's more than 50% disintegrated. In just a few hundred years, it will be completely non-existent. Now, I know that things erode quicker underwater, of course. But use cars as an example. You leave a car outside for 50 years and you can see through one door to the other. The cloth or leather seats are completely just gone and the only thing left is springs. And like the car, I mean, how many hundreds of years or even a couple thousand years would it take for it to just be completely just absorbed back into the earth and just non-existent, right? So when we talk about a period of 12,000 years, guys, everything's gone, just like houses. How many decades before a roof caves in, the walls cave in, and whatever it was made up of is just nothing but gravel and dust and dirt and just non-existent. How many thousands of years? Even if it was 5,000 years, when we're talking about 12,000 years ago, guys, you know, for Michael Shermer to not, to completely just reduce the significance of Gobekli Tepe and say that they need to see more tools. Like, guys, we could probably go to Sears and buy a, a, a toolbox and a bunch of tools and just throw it in the dirt. And if we came back in 12,000 years, honestly, what would be left? Even stainless steel materials, what would be left at that period of at that point? Think about that. And for Michael Shermer to, you know, reduce the significance of Gobekli Tepe, I mean, I think Graham Hancock handled it well as far as, well, I mean, he didn't handle everything well. I'll get to that in a second. But saying that, look, the site in itself is the significance. That's the big mystery. You know, when you have a site with hundreds of pillars that are enormous, I mean, never mind how they cut and carved it, never mind how they moved the stone, how were they able to align it perfectly true north? I mean, and not to mention 7,000 years older than Stonehenge. Like, I'm going to, I mean, I don't know. Anyone that reduces the significance of that, I would, I seriously question either their analytical thinking abilities or their intentions. And when it comes to Michael Shermer, it's not the analytical thinking abilities. That guy's brilliant. He's incredibly articulate. And the fact that I clearly, in my opinion, he's in it for the money, he's an establishment shill for sure. You know, Shermer, if you're in it for the money, I, you would you would make a lot more money if you bought into the ideas suggested by Graham Hancock. Maybe not all of them, but even Randall Carlson as an example. I guarantee you, with your level-headedness, your ability to just not bite back when skeptics attack you, as we saw. I mean, you handled your you had such a professional demeanor, like totally impressed by you. Um, I just wish you would have more of an open mind, okay? And if you were to have an, more of an open mind. Uh, and you were to be on the side, you know, trying to debunk the establishment, which needs to happen. More people need to do this. The narrative is freaking wrong. I mean, have we not learned throughout history just how wrong human civilization always is, right? And, and you know, <laughs> then that brings me on to Mark DeFont. So, man, what a freaking naysayer. How unproductive is this gentleman for the entire scientific community and for the progress of humanity? Make no mistake, if Mark, if Mark DeFont was born 400 freaking years ago, he would have been leading the mob of naysayers and angry people that were demanding that Galileo be tortured and executed for simply proving and validating the theories set forth by Copernicus that the Earth rotates around the sun. Sounds harsh, huh? Doesn't it? But think about what he did with his hit piece on Graham Hancock. Now, Graham Hancock, he just read off a few passages of it, but if you read it from start to finish... 
I mean, you really get a sense of, wow, who and why would someone write something like that? So, to be so disingenuous is the nice way of saying it. It was a hit piece, it was disrespectful, and was very indicative of where his line of thought is. But that's not to say that Mark DeFont isn't incredibly educated, and he held his own against Randall Carlson. However, for him to try and refute some of the evidence that Randall Carlson presented involving the massive flooding, from someone like myself who has really studied up on Randall Carlson, looked at his works, uh, you know, visited, you know, clearly Mark DeFont hasn't. And, you know, for someone to be so apprehensive against these ideas and to try and refute them when clearly, honestly, he's just off base, he's a bit wrong on a lot of things he mentioned, you know, it's like, dude, I think if he put his, his own ego aside a little bit and, and, and just chilled out, you know, it would help him a lot. And I would say the same thing about Graham Hancock, who, by the way, I just love. I would love to meet this gentleman, go out for a freaking dinner and pick his brain or have some cocktails or, <laughs> or smoke a joint or whatever. Graham Hancock is brilliant. Uh, is he right about everything? I would say no. But, you know, who cares? Neither was Einstein or, or Tesla, right? Um, and, the, you know, his works that he, and the research that he's done for the last few decades, you know, look, I was listening to this podcast in bed. I listened to part, part of it one night and then finished it the next day yesterday. And my wife was listening and like, why is he getting so apprehensive? She was getting turned off by Graham for being so upset. Um, and I agree, you know, he wears his emotions on his sleeves. But, you know, to give him a little bit of credit, and yes, I would say in the future, I would like, I would love to talk to him and be like, hey, man, you got to you gotta learn how to discipline yourself to not push back, not to bite back at the skeptics quite as bad. But that being said, for him to have been working on the things that he has for as many decades as he has, to present actual scientific data and evidence, and to be more knowledgeable than most of his critics on the subject matter, in fact, if not all of them, to only be called, to be ridiculed, shunned, and and called names that are completely inappropriate and just ignored? How pissed would that make you? How many decades could anyone stand up to that shit before they'd finally be like, what the fuck is going on? Excuse my language. So, um, you know, so some people were very uh, critical of Graham Hancock for getting upset. I see it both ways. But ultimately, I think Graham Hancock handled the subject of Gobekli Tepe very well. And you can see it in the comments. I would say at least three out of four comments were overwhelmingly supportive of Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock uh, diminishing the perspectives of Shermer and DeFont. You know, and it's like, it reminds me real quick, I got to mention, for, for Shermer to state that those cave paintings from 30,000, 40,000 years ago were more impressive or at least as impressive as Gobekli Tepe, I mean, that's lame. That's, ri that's a ridiculous comparison. And, you know... So that brings me on real quick to Joe Rogan. I thought he was an outstanding moderator. I only saw a little bit of criticism, some people saying that he interrupted Shermer and they didn't like that. Uh, no, uh, Joe Rogan, if it wasn't for Joe Rogan, first of all, none of this podcast would have even existed. So mad props to him for bringing this whole thing together and making it happen, right? But he held people accountable, Shermer and DeFont. If it wasn't for Joe Rogan, that conversation would have been much, much different. And you know, people need when people are wrong, and they're actively rebutting scientific data, which is really con conclusive. And, and to anyone that hasn't seen the prior podcasts, and you're only coming into this one, the most recent, you don't have the full picture. So Joe Rogan, in my opinion, did a fantastic job. And you know, thank goodness for this, uh, for this podcast altogether, because regardless of where you stand, your viewpoint is on any of it, this is awesome for humanity. It's getting new conversations started. And it's also painting a fantastic picture for the masses to see what truth seekers are up against. It, it paints a picture of what's been happening throughout history, where the scientific community has always ag gone against the new, you know, new ideas. Whether it's Copernicus or Galileo or, or Tesla or the freaking Wright brothers. Don't forget, the Wright brothers were being ridiculed leading up to their first flight. Moments before it, don't forget what people were saying. Most of the mainstream was so against them. Not everyone, but most. So you have to understand that, you know, you can come forward with scientific evidence and data overwhelming, that's overwhelming. And you'll still have people that's like, don't even want to process it. And it's really unproductive. It's really unhealthy. But uh, anyways, this podcast painted a great picture of it. So I'm going to close this up. But ultimately, the evidence is there that the history of human civilization is far older than what we were taught in school. And we were far more advanced than we ever realized. How advanced? I don't know. How far back do we date? I don't know that either. What I do know is that what they're still teaching in the textbooks about, like, say, the cradle of civilization, the Sumerians 6,000 years ago, has been debunked. Research this subject more on your own, but definitely check out these podcasts. And uh, hey, Joe Rogan, if you're listening, 
uh, please bring me on your show someday. I would love to talk to you about so many different topics. Spirituality, DMT, freaking medical marijuana, uh, ancient human civilization, the cataclysm, you name it, egos. There's so many things that uh, I just love that you talk about. So anyways, I'll leave it at that. I'm Jimmy. This is Bright Insight. Like and subscribe. Leave me a comment. Let me know what your thoughts are. And I have many videos to come on a whole wide variety of topics. <laughs> Take care, everybody.